Hello, my name is Colleen D'Alessandro, and I am the FAA New England Regional Administrator. I'm very pleased to be with you today to talk about the aircraft operations and airspace over Boston and surrounding communities, including Boston Logan International Airport, Hanscom Field in Bedford, Beverly, Lawrence, and Norwood airports. The FAA, along with the Massachusetts Port Authority and representatives from the airline industry, want to take this opportunity to give you an overview of aircraft operations and airspace over the greater Boston region, including airport development and the roles that each of us play. While some of you are very familiar with the airspace above the Boston region and operations at Boston Logan, we understand that this topic may be unfamiliar to others. So today, we hope to bring you all up to speed on how and why aircraft operate as they do in the greater Boston region. We'll walk through a plain language breakdown of how we operate the airspace above you. We'll explain key arrival and departure operational flows at Boston and operations by smaller propeller-driven aircraft at a few of the surrounding general aviation airports. But first, a little history. Boston Logan turns 100 years old in 2023. I would like to take this time to highlight some of the key milestones in that history. The airport started operations in September 1923, and at that time it was mainly used by the Massachusetts Air National Guard and the United States Army Air Corps. During this time, it was known as Jeffrey Field. Colonial Air Transport, the airport's first commercial airline, initiated service in 1927 between Boston and New York. The airport continued to grow, and by 1949, the Boutwell Terminal, which now houses terminals B, C, and D, was built. In 1955, the airport's first air traffic control tower was built. Boston continued to grow with four runways and numerous connecting taxiways and terminal buildings. In order to support the growing airport, a new 22-story air traffic control tower was opened in 1973. As Boston Logan grew, residents around the airport became concerned about the impact of the airport on their communities. In 1985, the airport, continuing to acknowledge community concerns, developed a voluntary sound insulation program where approximately 418 structures, including schools and homes in East Boston, were sound attenuated. To date, a total of over 5,400 homes and 36 schools have been sound attenuated with approximately $170 million in investments from FAA and Massport. In 1995, Massport established the Logan Airside Improvements Planning Project to evaluate earlier FAA airport capacity studies in order to support certain recommendations of the studies. At the time, Boston Logan Airport was consistently ranked as one of America's most delayed airports. In response to the FAA's record of decision on the Logan Airside Improvements Planning Project Environmental Impact Statement in 2002, the Boston Logan Airport Noise Study, which is better known as BLANS, was conducted to identify and implement measures to reduce noise impacts to communities surrounding the airport. The measure committed the FAA to work jointly with Massport and the Logan Airport Community Advisory Committee to develop the scope of a noise study that would include enhancing existing or developing new noise abatement measures. The study was conducted in three phases. Phase one, during which the study was referred to as the Boston Overflight Noise Study, or simply BONDS, began in 2003 and culminated in October 2007. Phase two began in early 2007 and was completed in December 2012. And phase three began in July 2013 and was concluded in December 2016. During these phases, various noise abatement measures and procedures were recommended and evaluated to include the implementation of performance-based navigation, or simply PBN, arrivals, departures, and approaches, and runway use measures were also considered. The implementation of new technology PBN procedures, including RNAV, 
was part of a nationwide FAA initiative to increase the safety, efficiency, and resiliency in the nation's air traffic system and offered new possibilities for noise abatement. Continuing our strong partnership, in 2016, the FAA and Massport signed a Memorandum of Understanding that established a framework for cooperation in exploring, evaluating, and advancing changes to procedures to reduce impacts from overflight noise, while at the same time maintaining the safety and efficiency benefits of PBN procedures at Boston. This MOU resulted in a partnership between FAA, Massport, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the Massport Community Advisory Committee. And in 2017, an initial set of recommendations were proposed. These are known as Block 1. When the procedures were first presented to the FAA, some did not meet safety criteria. So the FAA, working within the MOU framework, made changes but maintained the path over the bay away from homes while maintaining compliance with design and safety criteria. The first change moved aircraft departing on runway 15 right further north away from the densely populated areas near the town of Hull. The second change moved aircraft on approach to runway 33 left out over the water, similarly away from densely populated areas near Hull. Pilots can use both procedures seven days a week during both day and night hours. And these two community requested procedures were published in December 2021 and are now in use. More recently, in early 2022, a second set of recommendations called Block 2 were proposed. These include modification to runway 22 left RNAV standard instrument departure with a speed restriction to enable an earlier turn to the east which shifts aircraft tracks further north away from the town of Hull. The second recommendation was to implement a new overwater RNAV approach for runway 22 left that crosses the Nahant Causeway from the east to join a four mile final approach. Arrival flight paths from the south and east are moved over water instead of overflying populated areas north and northeast of the airport. These community requested procedures are currently in the FAA design process, and we hope to publish them later this year. While a lot has changed since the airport first served commercial passengers in 1927, the FAA continues to work in partnership with Massport, the airlines, and the surrounding communities on reducing the negative impacts of aviation. I hope this overview provides a better understanding of the history of Boston Logan and our commitment to continually engaging in meaningful dialogue with communities. Hello, my name is Lisa Whelan, and I'm the CEO of the Massachusetts Port Authority. Welcome to the FAA's Boston Area Communities Public Information Workshop. I want to thank the FAA for coordinating this forum for community leaders and for residents. We fully support community engagement events like this and believe they provide an important opportunity to inform others of our decision-making processes and provide us with a chance to respond to questions and hear comments from neighboring residents like you. The Massachusetts Port Authority, or Massport, is an independent public authority. Massport owns and operates three airports, Boston Logan International Airport, Worcester Regional Airport, and Hanscom Field. We also own and operate public facilities in the Port of Boston, including Conley Container Terminal and Flynn Cruiseport, Boston. And we are the landlord for maritime and commercial real estate tenants. At Massport, our mission is to be a world-class organization of people, moving people and goods, connecting Massachusetts and New England to the world, safely, securely, and efficiently, with a commitment to sustainability, our neighboring communities, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Massport's facilities are essential for a range of economic activities, including trade, commerce, tourism, and economic growth in the city of Boston, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the entire New England region. Our facilities generate more than $22 billion in annual economic impact and support over 100,000 direct jobs. Boston Logan International Airport is one of the state's most critical transportation assets. In fact, this year, Logan turns 100. Logan has a comprehensive network of nonstop service to major domestic and international destinations and is served by a diverse array of airlines. 
This diversity of airlines provides a competitive and comprehensive route network for the traveling public and for air cargo. In 2019, pre-pandemic, Logan accommodated 42 and a half million passengers. However, Logan activity declined by 98% at the height of the pandemic. Although we have recovered substantially, overall volumes in 2022 were down by about 15% relative to those pre-pandemic levels. As Logan recovers, we continue to watch key developments that may impact our recovery. Both Worcester Regional Airport and Hanscom Field offer more choices for the region's business and leisure travelers. Worcester Regional Airport serves the central Massachusetts region, offering commercial airline and general aviation services. Delta, JetBlue, and American provide easy access to Florida and New York. Massport and the FAA have invested over $150 million in the airport, including the CAT-3 instrument landing system, which is state-of-the-art equipment for low visibility operations. Hanscom Field is the region's busiest full-service general aviation airport and serves a vital role as a general aviation reliever for Boston Logan. Hanscom Field provides easy access to the greater Boston area and its suburbs and has three first-class fixed base operators, also known as FBOs, that provide flight support services, including aircraft refueling, maintenance, repair and storage, along with passenger service. Although the pandemic required Massport to cut some of our planned investments, we continue to modernize key aspects of our infrastructure. Our projects include adding gates and modern space to Terminal E, connecting Terminals B and C, and replacing antiquated roadways. We recently hosted President Joe Biden as we celebrated a grant from the FAA, which is funded by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. That grant will be used to help pay for improvements to Terminal E and Terminal Area Roadways. Recognizing that Massport's facilities, and particularly Boston Logan, are situated in an urban setting with community neighbors, Massport works hard through our comprehensive community engagement program to reduce impacts from our operational activity, pursue environmental actions to benefit our surrounding communities, and ensure economic benefits of our facilities reach our closest neighbors. Massport's park and open spaces in East Boston and South Boston provide the community with a space to gather and to enjoy. Later this year, we will be opening Pierce Park 2, creating an additional four and a half acres of green space along the East Boston waterfront. We are making targeted community investments, such as a residential sound insulation program in collaboration with our FAA partners. Massport also has an active charitable contributions program, awarding grants monthly to local organizations. We support civic and social service agencies through our community summer jobs program, and award scholarships to high school students yearly through our STEM and Memorial Scholarships program. Finally, Massport employees participate in a number of volunteer and donation efforts that benefit our neighboring communities, including the Backpack Project for Children, a Thanksgiving food drive, and our Children's Winter Coat Drive. An important and highly successful strategy to reduce congestion and emissions while providing important customer service options is Massport's HOV initiative. Expanded HOV options include five Logan Express sites, like the Back Bay service, a Silver Line connection to South Station, on-airport free shuttle buses to the Blue Line, and water ferry docks. A year ago, Massport set an ambitious goal to become net zero by 2031. This goal applies to Massport controlled emissions, identified as Scope 1 and Scope 2, and in parallel, we are continuing to work with our customers, partners, and tenants to reduce their emissions, known as Scope 3. Our Net Zero Plan places Massport at the forefront of leaders in the Commonwealth with a commitment to action by 2031, contributing to the Commonwealth's goal of reducing its emissions by 75% in 2040 and becoming a net zero state in 2050. One year into our net zero journey, we advanced multiple initiatives, including seeking LEED Gold certification for Terminal E's modernization, generating 75% more energy than planned from our Terminal C solar array, submitting potential maritime and aviation projects to the Department of Energy's Regional Clean Hydrogen Hub, and installing EV charging stations at Worcester Airport. Massport will also encourage and support emission reductions by our business partners, encouraging HOV and EV usage to and from Logan Airport, supporting tenant fleet management conversion to electric ground service equipment, facilitating sustainable aviation fuel, also called SAF, and SAF's development and use here, and supporting energy efficiency and promoting waste reduction. In closing, thank you for this opportunity to inform you about what we do every day at Massport and to share with you our efforts to reduce our environmental footprint. This video provides an overview of aircraft operations and the airspace in the greater Boston area. 
We'll talk about how air traffic operates, the complexities of Boston's airspace, and the procedures air traffic controllers use to keep airplanes safely separated. Boston Logan Airport and the nearby General Aviation Airports combined are a complex airspace that operates over a population of more than 4 million people. The region is served by numerous airports with commercial flights and smaller general aviation propeller aircraft, business jets, and military flights. Each airport, regardless of its size or the type of aircraft that operate there, has its own airspace with dedicated arrival and departure routes that guide aircraft in and out of the Boston area, connecting to the larger National Airspace System, or NAS. These airports serve a wide range of aircraft of different sizes with varying performance capabilities. It is critical to keep different types of aircraft and the numerous traffic flows separated from each other. The primary responsibility of the FAA's air traffic control system is to provide the safe, orderly, and expeditious flow of air traffic. This is done by teams of FAA air traffic controllers that ensure airplanes are safely separated while maintaining the most efficient flow of air traffic. Air traffic control requires great precision and is highly complex. When an airport is constructed, the runways are built to align with the most common wind directions in the area. This is because aircraft take off and land into the wind to maximize performance and safety. In the Boston area, winds are variable and come from all directions, and most airports in the region have at least two runways to accommodate aircraft operations and varying wind conditions. As shown in this animation, Boston Logan has six runways. Since each runway end is treated as a separate surface, there are actually 12 runways. Runway identification is based on the magnetic compass heading the aircraft is facing as it lands or takes off. For example, runway 422 is oriented with a magnetic compass heading of approximately 40 degrees in one direction and 220 degrees in the opposite direction. If you drop the zero at the end of the compass heading, you will get 4 and 22. Parallel runways are further designated with L for left or R for right as you approach or depart the runway. At Boston Logan, aircraft will land and take off typically in one of three operational flows, identified by the direction aircraft are landing and departing, depending on the winds. This example shows aircraft in northeast flow, landing and departing on runway 4 left and 4 right, and departing on runway 9. The other primary operational flows include southwest and northwest. In the busy Boston region, airports may seem far apart. The distance between airports is the same on the ground as it is in the sky. However, aircraft travel at a great rate of speed, greatly reducing the duration time between airports when compared to travel by car. This is another reason why air traffic controllers work to ensure aircraft are properly separated from each other. Aircraft operate using both instruments and visual references. These two types of flying are called Instrument Flight Rules IFR, and Visual Flight Rules VFR. These types of flying require different levels of air traffic guidance. However, all aircraft must maintain safe separation from each other and terrain. Air traffic controllers help manage and separate all types of aircraft, from the largest commercial jet to the smallest propeller aircraft within the designated airspace. For example, when Boston is in northwest flow, Aircraft landing on runway 32 fly over aircraft landing on runway 27. These aircraft are given altitude and compass headings to follow to maintain required separation. Not only are there operations from multiple airports in the region, there are also helicopter and seaplane operations which each have their own unique routes. Helicopters have seven primary routes within the Boston area used by the military, news agencies, law enforcement, emergency medical services, and sightseeing operations. Helicopter routes were designed to be over major transportation corridors. Helicopters may stray from these routes for operational needs such as during news events or when providing emergency services. Seaplanes generally operate in the channel and along the Charles River using visual references to fly. When a seaplane lands, arriving aircraft at Boston Logan must be sequenced to make room for the seaplane. Finally, there are numerous general aviation airports in the greater Boston area which predominantly serve propeller and business jet aircraft with limited commercial service. Many of these general aviation operations are small propeller training aircraft that fly a pattern around an airport to land and take off. In order to reduce impacts on neighboring communities, voluntary noise abatement routes have been implemented, such as the pattern at Norwood Airport to reduce operations over the town by aircraft turning to 230 degrees at the runway end, then turning on course after reaching 1,000 feet mean sea level. 
As you can see, there are many layers to managing airspace, including high traffic volume, proximity of surrounding airports, helicopter and seaplane routes, and weather. All of this is accomplished every day by a team of highly trained air traffic controllers. Hello, my name is Barrett Brown and I'm an operations manager at Boston Tracon. I've been actively involved in air traffic within the Boston area for the last 17 years. This presentation will walk you through the flight procedure poster boards for the arrival and departure procedures in the Boston region. Each of the following boards shows a sampling of approach and departure procedures with current day flight tracks color coded in blue. These flight tracks represent a random sample from summer 2022, unless otherwise noted. The flight tracks and procedures are all overlaid on a map for the surrounding area. Each flight procedure board is oriented with north facing up. The name of each flight procedure is shown by an arrow on the map containing a five letter name. Arrows for arrival procedures point toward the airport, while arrows for departure procedures point away from the airport. For example, this board shows four departures, the Highland, Pats, Celtic, and Bruin. These are called SIDS, or Standard Instrument Departures. A few acronyms are used by air traffic controllers explaining the boards and in the text. The spelling of each departure and arrival procedure is limited to five letters. For example, the spelling of H-Y-L-N-D, departure, is pronounced Highland. The stars on the board are locations of waypoints, which are fixed navigational points in space that the aircraft fly to. Just as with the spelling of procedures, waypoints are spelled with five letters. For example, the C-O-L-Y-N waypoint would be pronounced calling. The flight procedures are colored purple for departures and orange for arrivals. These colored paths show the existing published flight paths. Surrounding the paths are dispersed path areas in either pink for departures or yellow for arrivals. These areas show the typical locations where aircraft fly and account for the different routing to avoid hazardous weather, for operational need, or for safety. When aircraft fly in these areas, it is typically due to a pilot receiving a compass heading from air traffic control. A vector is a magnetic compass heading assigned to an aircraft in a radar environment by an air traffic controller at the Boston Consolidated Tracon or the airport tower. The procedures will use satellite and GPS for guidance as well as ground-based navigational aids. For arriving aircraft, once on the standard terminal arrival route, or STAR, controllers may either give the pilot a vector to the final approach, fly the entire procedure and would be issued the RNAV approach, or use traditional ground-based navigation called an ILS. RNAV is an acronym for area navigation that allows properly equipped aircraft to fly precise routes all the way to the runway, and ILS stands for Instrument Landing System. Aircraft arriving or departing may be vectored off their procedure for operational need, safety, or for hazardous weather. Aircraft that are vectored are given a different heading to fly than the published procedure. The bullet points on the right side provide additional details about the procedures. This board shows an overview of existing arrival and departure procedures in Southwest Flow at five busy airports in the greater Boston area. There are 67 airports within Boston Consolidated Tracon's airspace boundary. As this board shows, the airspace in the greater Boston area is busy and complex, with aircraft arriving and departing at numerous airports simultaneously. Air traffic controllers manage over 2,000 flights per day within this airspace that is part of the overall national airspace system, ensuring the safety of those in the air and on the ground. This board shows the same flight tracks as the previous board, but these arrival and departure radar flight tracks are color-coded by altitude. These flight tracks are a random sample from summer 2022 and represent a typical day when the operational flow at Boston Logan is in the southwest flow. As you can see, aircraft departing Logan fly over the bay and those that turn to the north or east cross the shoreline at or above 10,000 feet, shown by the flight tracks color-coded in green as they cross back over the shoreline. While aircraft typically cross the shoreline around 10,000 feet on these published procedures, aircraft are required to be at least 6,000 feet. Airports that have predominantly propeller aircraft operations, such as Norwood and Beverly, have numerous aircraft operations at lower altitudes, including training aircraft that stay near the airport and fly a takeoff and landing pattern. Hello, my name is Scott Coleman, and I'm a staff support specialist at the Boston Air Traffic Control Tower. I've been actively involved in aviation and air traffic for more than 42 years, with the last 30 of those years being at both the Consolidated TRACON and the Air Traffic Control Tower. This animation shows the runways used when Logan is operating in the Northwest flow. When winds come from the Northwest, we use runways 27, 33 left, 33 right, and 32. Aircraft may land on runway 27 and 32 and depart on runway 33 left. 
The primary runways in this configuration are runway 27 and runway 33 left. Runway 32 is only available for landing aircraft. It is not used for departures in any operational configuration. This board shows the published standard terminal arrival routes for STARS when operating in a Northwest flow. Aircraft may land using one of the three arrival procedures or may be given a vector by air traffic control. During busy times, aircraft may need to be vectored to be properly sequenced to land, ensuring aircraft are properly separated. Aircraft arriving on runway 27 from the west, east, and south fly on published STARS to line up for the final approach. Aircraft from the south on Roebuck will cross the shoreline at or above 8,000 feet mean sea level. Aircraft are then sequenced to line up on the final approach. They must remain three miles apart laterally, or what we call miles and trail, to maintain safe separation. Aircraft that land on runway 32 are given a vector heading by air traffic control. This board shows one of the departure operational flows when the winds are from the northwest. In this configuration, runway 33 left and runway 27 are used for departures. Aircraft departing runway 33 left fly to the tech waypoint, then turn to the north, west, or south to continue on the published procedure. Air traffic control sequences departures based on aircraft speed, destination, safety, and operational need. A slower aircraft may be turned immediately after flying over the tech waypoint if a faster aircraft departs after it. This allows for proper spacing to be maintained between the aircraft. As aircraft transition out of the local Boston airspace, separation between aircraft increases from three nautical miles to five nautical miles. Additionally, aircraft flying the same route from satellite airports need to be put in sequence with Logan traffic. This board also shows one of the departure operational flows when the winds are from the Northwest. In this configuration, just runway 33 left is used for departures. Similar to the board we just looked at, aircraft departing runway 33 left fly to the tech waypoint, then turn to the north, west, or south to continue on the published procedure. Air traffic control sequences departures based on aircraft speed, destination safety, and operational need. As aircraft transition out of the local Boston airspace, separation between the aircraft increases from three nautical miles to five nautical miles. As you can see on the graphic, aircraft flying to the west may fly on one of four initial routes out of the Boston area. This animation shows the runways used when Logan is operating the Southwest flow. When winds come from the Southwest, we use runways 22 left, 22 right, runway 27 and runway 15 right. Aircraft may land on runway 27 and depart on runway 22 left while departing on runway 22 right and 22 left and occasionally runway 15 right. The primary arrival runways in this configuration are runway 27 and runway 22 left. This board shows the published standard terminal arrival routes or STARS used when operating in a southwest flow on runway 27 and runway 22 left. Aircraft may land using one of the published arrival procedures or may be given a compass heading by air traffic control. During busy times, aircraft may need to be vectored to be properly sequenced to land, ensuring aircraft are properly separated. In this configuration, the primary arrival runway is runway 27, and the secondary arrival runway is runway 22 left. This is due to many factors, including the runway length and landing characteristics of aircraft. When aircraft land on runway 22 left, they may be involved in land and hold short operations, called lasso. This means an aircraft will land, then stop prior to an intersecting runway that another aircraft is landing on at the same time. Not all aircraft are capable of lasso, therefore runway 27 is the primary runway. Aircraft that land on runway 27 are not required to land and hold short. This board shows the published standard terminal arrival routes or STARS used when operating in a southwest flow on runways 22 left and 22 right. As this graphic shows, aircraft flight tracks that are within the yellow area on the map were given a compass heading by air traffic control to be vectored for landing. The main reason for vectors in this operational configuration is due to the difference in aircraft speeds on final approach and ensuring proper separation exists between the multiple aircraft coming from different directions en route to the final approach course for landing. This board shows one of the departure operational flows when the winds are from the southwest. In this configuration, runway 22 right and runway 22 left are used for departures and occasionally runway 15 right. Aircraft departing runway 22 right fly to the TJ waypoint, then turn to the north or south to continue on a published procedure. Just like the other operational flows, air traffic control sequences departures based on aircraft speed, destination, 
safety, and operational need. The pink area on the map shows where aircraft typically fly in a southwest flow. Aircraft may turn after reaching Tasket to maintain proper spacing between departing aircraft. The majority of aircraft on the westbound SIDS fly to the HUMO waypoint and then fly direct to the next waypoint on the route. When aircraft are landing on runway 27, aircraft that depart runway 15 right first fly runway heading, which is 150 or 150 degrees, then fly into Tasket and onto their destination. This animation shows the runways used when Logan is operating a northeast flow. When winds come from the northeast, we use runways 4 right, 4 left, and runway 9. The primary runway in this configuration is runway 4 right. This board shows the published standard terminal arrival routes, or STARS, used when operating in a northeast flow on runways 4 right and 4 left. As this graphic shows, aircraft flight tracks that are within the yellow area on the map were given a compass heading by air traffic control to be vectored for landing. These aircraft are sequenced to land with aircraft coming from the east and south. This board shows one of the departure operational flows when the winds are from the northeast. In this configuration, runways 4 left, 4 right, and runway 9 are used for departures. Aircraft departing runway 4 right fly to the Nahant waypoint, then turn to the north or south to continue on a published procedure. Just like the other operational flows, air traffic control sequences departures based on aircraft speed, destination, safety, and operational need. Aircraft that are turned once reaching the end of runway 9 are typically propeller aircraft which are assigned vectors to keep them separated from the flow of jet traffic. This board shows the visual helicopter routes in purple. Helicopters operate in the Boston area using both visual and instrument flight rules and include training, emergency services, medical transport, news, sightseeing, and law enforcement. Helicopter operations that most operate using instrument flight rules are medical transports going to and from the numerous hospitals in the Boston area. Oftentimes, helicopters fly at altitudes lower than propeller aircraft for the purposes of their mission, but must always remain clear of aircraft operating at Logan. For example, when aircraft arrive on runway four left or right, helicopters may fly at 400 feet mean sea level on portions of the bay or quarry routes. Also, helicopters may fly in other areas as they transition to and from the purple helicopter routes. In addition to the runways at Boston Logan, there is also a seaplane base in the harbor. There are several seaplane operational flows that allow for simultaneous seaplane operations with the regular Logan air traffic. We will look at the innermost portions of the seaplane arrival and departure paths. As the seaplanes near the water landing area, they arrive either from the southeast and depart to the northwest, or they arrive from the northwest and depart to the southeast. Under ideal wind conditions, we can have them arrive from the northwest and then depart to the northwest. The seaplane operations that occur at Boston are conducted by a commercial operator and must follow the same rigorous standards set by the FAA for all commercial air carriers, including having two pilots, specific aircraft maintenance requirements, and required periodic checks of the pilots by FAA flight standards personnel. These operations are conducted with Cessna Grand Caravan EX aircraft, which are multi-million dollar sophisticated aircraft. The Cessna Caravan has operated all over the globe for decades. When equipped with amphibious floats, which add almost a million dollars to the cost of the aircraft, they can land on water with the wheels up and on hard runway surfaces with the wheels down. The ability to land on water or land gives the operator flexibility for safety, weather, or other operational considerations. For example, on any given day, if the weather is not conducive to water operations, the seaplanes can simply land and depart at Logan Airport. Hello again. I'm Colleen D'Alessandro, the Regional Administrator for the FAA's New England Region. Thank you for participating in our virtual public workshop. I'll be the moderator for this discussion. I'd like to cover three procedural items before we start the Q&A. First, if you're having technical issues connecting to the workshop, you can text our tech support number anytime during the workshop. That number is 949-478-0253. Second, this workshop will last for approximately two hours. Third, we're also live streaming on the FAA's Facebook feed and the FAA's YouTube channel. 
A recording of this workshop will be available on FAA's YouTube channel shortly after the end of the workshop. All the slides shown during the recorded introduction are also included in the recording. Because addressing community concerns about aviation is a joint responsibility that we share with the aviation industry in airports across the country, we're pleased to have our airport partners from Massport joining us today. In addition, we have representatives from JetBlue, Cape Air, and the National Business Aviation Association. They'll answer your questions about their operations and offer their perspectives. Let me introduce you to our panelists. I'll start with the FAA team, Richard Doucette. Richard is an env FAA's Environmental Protection Specialist. Next, we have Veronda Johnson. Veronda is also an FAA Environmental Protection Specialist. Then we have Barrett Brown. Barrett is an Operations Manager at Boston Consolidated Terminal Radar Approach Control, better known as the TRACON. From Massport, we have Flavio Leo. Flavio is the Director of Aviation Planning and Strategy at Massport. And we also have Steve Salprizio, the Manager of the Noise Abatement Office at Massport. Next, we have Heidi Williams. Heidi is the National Representative for the National Business Aviation Association, also known as NBAA. We also have Lee Brown. Lee is a Manager of Strategic Airspace Programs at JetBlue. And last, we have Steve Phillips. Steve is the Director of Operations at Cape Air. We sincerely appreciate the participation of our panelists. The challenges around aviation and noise are complex and must be addressed by the entire aviation community. I hope that the information provided in the live Q&A provide value. For your participation in the meeting, if you registered on the Zoom platform, please submit your questions on the Q&A tab. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, please submit your questions in the platform's chat area. I also want to mention that at yesterday's workshop, we received a lot of questions. We're trying our best to answer them all. But to be efficient, we're combining similar questions. So if you don't hear your specific question, that may be why. Also, if you're asking about a specific operation on a, on, on a single day, please submit your question directly to Massport's noise complaint line, or if you've already done that, you can submit a question directly to FAA's noise portal. Go to faa.gov noise, and you will receive a response. Before we start the question and answer portion of the meeting, I wanted to ask our panelists a couple of questions about how the airport, airspace, and aircraft all operate in this space. So the first question we'll ask our, uh, our airline panelists in NBAA. As we saw in the opening videos, the Boston area is incredibly complex for many reasons. We have variable weather, we have numerous airports, complex airport layouts, and all different kinds of airplanes operating in this complex airspace. For our panelists, how is Boston unique for your operations? And I'll ask Heidi first if she could answer that. Thanks, Colleen, and nice to be here with you all. Um, so from the business aviation perspective, I would say, you know, flying into an airport that's surrounded by water for one, coupled with the complexity that we just highlighted through the videos that, pr prior to our Q&A, and the weather in the New England and Northeast area, all of those factors coupled together really make for a unique environment in Boston. Thanks, Heidi. Steve, what do you think? Uh, for Cape Air, um, one of the most challenging things is the complexity of the airport as well as the airspace around it. So there's multiple procedures. be flexible enough to change um, runways if, if needed due to changing weather conditions and be flexible to adjust our speed to flow with the traffic flow and to make a smooth transition from the airspace to the runway. Thanks. Okay, uh, next question. 
This question is about how aircraft decide where to operate. We're seeing commercial air traffic across the country at levels higher than those before COVID, and general aviation activity has also remained steady. I'd like to first ask Lee with JetBlue and then Heidi with NBAA, what key factors do operators use to decide flight schedules and what airport? Thank you, Colleen, and, and um, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, for uh, for JetBlue, we are um, a, a customer-based uh, group, and we are going to try to build in uh, schedules and services that meet the, de the demands, the diverse demands of our customer base. Um, that being said, um, it, it, just to clarify, the um, you know we're the ones that determine our schedule and our flight uh, paths. Um, but meaning the origin and destination. Uh, we do have to follow the FAA's uh, procedures and routes in terms of how we fly between the different airports. Um, but the FAA doesn't necessarily determine the frequency of our flights. That's something that we do as part of the, um, the market base in terms of making sure that we're ser serving the community uh, in and around the airport uh, based on the needs as we understand them. And so maybe, I, you know, it's always fun to follow Lee on this question because uh, airlines and the business aviation, general aviation community have many things in common, but our, our business models for sometimes where we operate are a little different. We don't necessarily, as a business aviation community, always fly into Boston, um, but many of the same factors go into our decision making, right? Whether the complexity of the airspace constraints in the system all are factors as our members and operators are determining where they ultimately fly, but also where they really want to end up, right? So depending on where meetings or whatever their destination is, they may choose an airport that's closest to that ultimate event. So many different factors, but not necessarily a set schedule. There's a bit more flexibility built in to deal with that range of, of um of complexities. Thanks. Thank you both. Next question. Um, we received a lot of questions and comments about how the FAA is designing and managing performance-based navigation or PBN procedures. And that includes RNAV, which is an acronym for area navigation. I'm going to ask Barrett and then Steve um, to, to answer that one. So Barrett, can you start to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, first of all, the FAA is constantly modernizing the national airspace system, and we're committed to moving to a satellite-based navigation system away from all of our land-based systems that we have in place. And that satellite-based satellite -based navigation system is, is truly known as the performance-based navigation, or PBN, which we're talking about here. This is consistent with congressional direction, and it's necessi necessitated by the uh, growth in the system. You know, the the airlines and the aviation system is constantly growing, and we, we need to, to meet those demands as they come up. Now, as far as PBN itself and how it impacts air traffic on our end, you know, it creates flight paths that are more efficient. It helps us remedy airspace uh, congestion as it comes up, and it simplifies our air traffic control procedures, which all results in a safer system. And as we know, and all the community members know, the Boston area has a lot of airports, and Logan is one of the busiest in the country. So it's really important that we reduce that uh, complexity as much as we can. Thanks. And Steve, from an air carrier's perspective, what does PBN mean to you? I think the biggest thing for our air carriers is the ability to do GPS or RNAV procedures uh, for instrument approach procedures to do straight in approaches to the runway. Um, in the old days, we used to have to do curving approaches and uh, circling approaches, and that required higher weather minimums. So this gives us the ability to provide more reliable and dependable service in lower weather conditions because of the more stabilized approaches that the PBN allows for air carriers to accomplish. Thanks. Okay, next question. Um, again, this has um, been a hot, hot topic yesterday and already a number of questions today uh, regarding runway 33 left. So I'm gonna ask Barrett to start us off on this one. Um, why can't there be more dispersion when aircraft depart on runway 33 left? There are too many runway 33 left departures. Why can't they be spread out? 
So historically speaking, Boston Logan only uses runway 33 left for departures approximately 25% of the time, and that is throughout the year. And it really is based on seasonal use as well. And during the early morning hours, especially when we have a large departure bank, when there's transcontinental flights that are more pre uh, prevalent, uh, there's a greater use of runway 33 left for departures. That's due to the northwest winds we see, a uh, need for a greater length of runway required because these aircraft are heavier, they're larger, they're full of fuel, full of passengers. And also there's some uh, construction cranes off the end of runway 27 in, in the Boston city area that have been impacting the departures off of runway 27 over the last couple of years. Um, and later on in the afternoon and into the evening, those large number of transatlantic and international carriers that we see come in from overseas, they tend to request a longer runway as well uh, for their departures for the same reasons. And this can be runway three through left depending on the winds at the time uh, when those aircraft arrive or depart. Regarding dispersion versus concentration of flights, uh, departing runway three through left, uh, as we have and will continue to discuss the SIDS, as we've talked about, provide predict uh, predictability. And in a very complex area like Boston Logan, um, which is in close proximity to uh, lots of other airports in, in a large city. Um, it is uh, critical uh, that we do not take them off those uh, pre, uh, pre established routes in a complex area and during a critical phase of flight. Now, we do have some ability to um, take them off uh, the departures as needed for safety reasons, obviously, but we like to keep them on as much as possible because it is so complex in and around the airport. Um, there's also a lot of binding legal decisions that have come about in the last decades around Boston that restrict any changes to our current SIDS as, as they are designed today. Thanks, Barrett. Um, I know this is a this is a question that's on a lot of people's minds, and we wanted to just take a little bit of extra time when we get started to talk about um, a, a number of aspects of this. So Barrett kind of talked about it from a operational perspective. Um, I wanted to just touch on dispersion. One of the biggest challenges with dispersing dispersing noise is getting communities to agree on how to share the noise. Dispersion, dispersion doesn't reduce the total amount of noise. Instead, it distributes it among more people. So for every, everyone who gets less noise, there are other neighboring communities who are getting more noise. And that's a difficult conversation between communities. We have been working with MIT through our research efforts to understand how we can use supplemental metrics to help facilitate the discussion that might be needed to determine how to share the noise from aircraft operations. MIT did make a recommendation that would have provided greater dispersion, but the communities felt that that proposal didn't really didn't go far enough and it didn't do um, anything to spread out the noise in what they considered a significant way. So therefore they voted against it. So that was one proposal. Um, the MIT study also looked at a number of other options for run runway 33 left, but ultimately that uh, single recommendation was made. And at this point in time, that is um, the best proposal uh, that we have to offer. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm going to ask Veranda to cover this one. How are ultrafine particles managed from airplanes and how are they integrated with surface transportation? Okay, thank you, Colleen. Both the um, Environment Protection Agency and FAA have determined that aircraft operations at or above mixing height of 3,000 feet above ground level have a very small effect on pollutant concentrations at ground level. While 3,000 feet above ground level is the threshold established by EPA and the FAA, our research on mix and heights indicates that changes in air traffic procedures above 1,500 feet above ground level and below the mix and height would have little, if any, effect on emissions and ground concentrations. More information can be found at the, our website, faa.gov slash reg regulations. Thanks, Rhonda. Thank you, Brian. Next question is for Barrett. Has there been a new arrival path published for Logan? It seems like there are arrivals in new areas. So there have been no new arrival paths per se created. Um, there have been upgrades uh, by introducing satellite navigation procedures, which overlay our existing ones that we already have in place. Uh, one exception to this, though, is that we do have the new RNAV GPS approach to runway four left, which is currently under review. 
Okay, question for Steve from Cape Air. Could aircraft climb at a faster rate to be higher sooner? And would runway use influence this? Uh, the runway use definitely influences it. Um, taking off into the wind provides us the ability to have a, a steeper climb angle and a better takeoff performance. But we are restricted uh, with the aircraft performance limitations. There's many charts that we have to follow uh, to determine that performance uh, based on runway selection. Um, the aircraft that we fly specifically are, are kind of limited in climb performance, depending on the weight of the aircraft and the load that it's carrying. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, Thinking back to this question, the question around runway 33 left departures and the cranes um, off of 27 and um, thinking about aircraft performance, right? So the cranes bring a challenge to utilizing that runway. Is it partly because the aircraft may not have the performance to get high enough, fast enough to get over the cranes? Yeah, when there's an obstruction that encroaches into the uh, departure plane, as they call it, um, it requires uh, changes to performance um, requirements to meet that that uh, description. So certain aircraft can meet it and certain have to be turned early. Uh, for our specific aircraft, we have the ability to work with ATC and take like an early turnout since we don't need as much runway on 3-3 left. Um, however, if it's instrument conditions and we have to do the standard procedures, then we are limited on on our ability to um, meet those client performance. Thanks. Okay, another question for Barrett. I would like to know why there has been an increase in flights leaving from 33 left over the past year, an increase of over 1,000 flights. Cranes have been removed from obstruction, and there is a significant group of individuals who are severely impacted by this flight pattern. So the initial factor for determining runway configuration is obviously we've talked about is weather and wind. Those are the two main factors we, we look at first. Uh, next, we'd probably look at user demand. That's that's a high on our list of priorities. So increased uh, usage of runway 33 left probably indicates that there's been more days of a northwest wind uh, at the airport. And you can look at the weather and see that that has been a case most of the time. The cranes that we've been talking about, they are temporary cranes. They're not permanent cranes. So they do go up and down. Different construction projects go on throughout the year. Um, and we adjust our uh, runway usage uh, with that as well. And I, I think, so this question said cranes have been removed from obstruction, but my understanding, maybe Flavio can touch on this, is um, that's not the case. Uh, yeah, there's still um, uh, cranes in the area of the South Boston waterfront and in, and in downtown as well. So there was still... Uh, a uh, variety of cranes in that, area, in that area. Okay, moving on. When will Logan impact, sorry, excuse me. When will Logan implement curfews or capacity caps? Um, Flavio, you wanna take that one? Uh, so Boston, Logan, and actually all of Massport's airports are public use airports. Uh, we've received federal federal grants over the many years we've operated them, and we've operated them as public use airports. So as long as uh, an aircraft and users have all the uh, meet all the requirements for flying in the nation's airspace, uh, they have access to our facilities. Uh, uh, there really is no mechanism uh, uh, to for us to, by just arbitrarily putting in a cap or or nighttime curfews. Um, there are some airports that have something like this. These have all been grandfathered over the years, and there is one process that airports are going to take to look at these kind of restrictions. But no one's been successful yet, uh, simply because. We now have a very quiet fleet. It's all uh, stage three or better. And uh, because you really can't um, do the analysis to justify the threshold that's there, I'm sure Richard can clarify that for the group. Uh, so primarily it's because we're a public use airports and we are open 24 seven. Thanks, Richard. Do you have anything to add to that? Sure, thanks Colleen. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, there were a number of airports around the country that were starting to implement their own individual noise restrictions. And Congress decided that this patchwork of regulations was uh, 
it was going to be very difficult to manage. So in 1990, uh, Congress passed uh, Aviation Noise and Capacity Act, some, sometimes called ANCA, and you can read up on it if you Google uh, FAA ANCA, uh, that made it uh, impossible for an individual airport to implement mandatory access restrictions. That's the phrase we use, mandatory access restrictions or a curfew. So if any airport owner or operator, whether it's a municipal airport or a uh, airport authority, would like to try to exclude particular types of aircraft because of their size or their weight or their noise, they would have to follow a process that's prescribed by this, by ANCA. Uh, and to my knowledge, no airport has successfully uh, achieved that. Um, and it would be very difficult going forward for anyone to do that. So it's it's a lot of people ask about curfews, but the FAA considers airports around the country just like uh, highways and railroads. And the highways and the railroads don't shut down at night and neither do the airports generally. Great, thank you both. Okay, next question. Uh, how much fuel is saved because of next gen? Um, we do have some information on our website uh, that can help answer that question, but um, just with a short answer, FAA estimates next gen improvements have provided 1.5 billion in fuel savings from 2010 through 2021. And you can find more information um, on those statistics at faa.gov slash nextgen, N-E-X-T-G-E-N slash reporting dash benefits. Let me say that again, faa.gov slash nextgen slash reporting dash benefits. Next question, when will FAA's noise portal data be published? So currently the data in from our noise portal is not published due to privacy requirements. Um, FAA is currently looking at ways to de-identify the data and make it available on our website. So um, you can look forward to that in the future. Uh, this, this question also, I think we got um, yesterday and there was perhaps a little bit of confusion between FAA's noise portal and Massport also has a, um, a noise complaint line and a, and a set of data. So maybe I'll just turn it over to Steve Soprizio and ask if he can touch on Massport's process. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we catalog complaints um, on the noise line, anything that comes in through the website or the telephone. Um, and then we, you know, investigate the complaints and then send responses back to uh, members of the public. We also uh, post some of that complaint data to our website, no personal information, just uh, mostly where the complaints are coming from, what towns, cities they're coming from, and the, the total number of complaints, as well as the numbers of individuals that complain. So all that data is available on our website and posted and updated every month. Great, thanks, Steve. Okay, next question is, how can we get a transcript of today's meeting? So as I mentioned earlier, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and will continue to be available after the end of the workshop. Um, the uh, recording will be available very, very shortly after we finish tonight, and yesterday's workshop uh, is already there. As a reminder, this is an informational workshop with an opportunity to ask subject matter experts questions about Boston airspace and operations. The questions to ask here are not comments on any proposed projects. And if there is a specific noise complaint, you may submit it to either the Massport Noise Office or FAA's Noise Complaint Portal. Okay, we next one is an environmental question and I'm gonna ask Veranda to cover this one. When was an environmental impact study done and was it done after the RNAV implementation? Okay, um, Colleen, environmental impact statement was complete in 2019. 
The National Environmental Policy Act of 1969 requires federal agencies to use an interdisciplinary approach in planning and decision-making proposed action that may adversely impact the environment. Therefore, prior to any procedure implementation, an environmental analysis must be completed. Thanks. For air traffic procedures um, actions, FAA first conducts an internal preliminary view of any potential environmental impacts, including a noise screening assessment. And then based on the preliminary screening, the FAA then determines the appropriate level of NEPA review. The three levels of NEPA review are category exclusion, an environmental assessment, and environmental impact statement. Thank you. Thanks. Richard, anything you want to add to that? The only thing I would add is uh, I think a lot of times the public misunderstands really the role of NEPA. The National Environmental Policy Act uh, is triggered by federal actions, not the ongoing operation of an airport day to day. So when the FAA has uh, a federal action to take, an approval or grant that might be issued, then that's what triggers NEPA. So uh, I think people just need to keep that in mind when they're thinking about the federal involvement. Uh, the FAA decided decades ago that um, airports would be owned and operated by non-federal entities, by state or local uh, organizations, not by the federal government. So NEPA does not regulate the, the ongoing operation of an airport. It regulates federal actions. So when the FAA is faced with a federal decision or approval, that's what triggers NEPA. Uh, and if people are really interested in the day-to-day -day operations of an airport and how it generates noise, they really need to uh, engage the airport owner and operator, not the FAA. Okay, thank you, Richard. This is the next question is gonna be for Massport. I'm gonna ask Steve to cover this. Um, and I'm gonna combine two questions. One, what happens when someone submits a noise complaint via the Massport site? How do you answer all those individually without preset answers? And two, what do you do with all those complaints? Thanks, Colleen. So I'll really reiterate a little bit of what I spoke to before, but we'll receive the complaints um, research each complaint um, individually and then see if we can see anything that was atypical as far as the procedures go. Um, and then we'll send a response back to the complainant as well as we copy the FA on those responses as well so they're um, aware of the complaint. Um, we do have some uh, preset answers just because as Barrett kind of explained, um, a lot of the operations at Logan are driven by wind and weather so that the reason in a lot of cases is why summer is overflown or what certain runways being used is, is wind and weather. Um, so there you know, can be some repetitive answers. It's just because the repeatability of, of the uh, you know, aircraft movements, the, the reasons don't change. Um, other than that, you know, we look for trends, anything out of the ordinary that we can pick up from the complaints in order to investigate them fully. Um, and then uh, part two, uh, what do we do with these complaints? Um, the complaints ser served a role in our MIT study. We do, as I mentioned before, catalog these complaints. We post them on the website, uh, but MIT used them to correlate flights to, um, you know, depict certain noise sensitive areas. So the information um, is used in, like I said, as, as part of that study as well. Thanks. And let me just give an example. So, um, you know, I got woke up this morning at 430 with a um, loud airplane that seemed awful low over my house on the North Shore. Um, I know I, I know what date it is. I know what time I send that into Massport. My understanding is that that gets specific flight would get investigated and a response provided. Is that right? Right. So in most cases, the more detail you can give us, the more, you know, we can research, um, you know, research the complaint. Uh, if it's a little more vague, it's a little bit more difficult to, you know, pick up on what, you know, what was really irritating the person at that time. So specifics really help as far as investigations go. But we would, you know, do an altitude check on that aircraft to make sure it's operating with normal, uh, you know, altitude range. 
Um, and then we would get back to that person to let them know that, you know, most likely the aircraft, uh, you know, was operating within its normal, normal range. Thanks. Right, next question is for me. Um, please provide an update on what actions the FAA has taken based on the findings of the FAA's January 2021 analysis of the Neighborhood Environmental Survey, also called the NES, in the more than 4,000 comments submitted in response to the FAA's request for input on research activities to inform aircraft noise policy. And that was FAA docket number FAA-2021-0037. So as stated earlier, the FAA is reviewing our noise policy as part of our ongoing commitment to address aircraft noise. In fact, we'll be publishing a Federal Register notice in the coming days to initiate engagement with the public and other stakeholders to provide input for the agency's consideration on potential changes to our noise policy. You can stay up to date on our noise policy review and sign up for alerts by visiting our website. And that website is faa.gov slash noise policy review. And that's all one word, noise policy review. Um, you can put in your email, and every time that website gets updated, uh, you will get an email. Okay, um, another question for me. In December, in, in a December 2021 response to comments on MIT Block 2 RNAV study report, Massport slash FAA stated that the FAA is studying ways to use PBN technology to create systematic dispersal of flight paths while maintaining safety and efficiency. Please provide an update on the status of these studies and a timeline for implementation. So firstly, it should be noted that procedure design concepts that create systematic dispersal, dispersal, I have trouble with that word, may introduce operational challenges that the FAA must assess on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure the safety and efficiency of operations. So what could work at one airport may not work at another. And these concepts must be considered within the context of the entirety of the airspace. Secondly, the implementation of dispersion requires coordination across communities, um, as I mentioned before, some communities would likely get increased noise exposure to enable others to get a reduction. So as part of the Boston Logan RNAV study, the FAA conducted research with MIT, which focused on metrics and methods for presenting noise exposure data to operational stakeholders and communities to ensure they're well informed of the trade-offs involved with deployment of systematic dispersion. MIT put forth a metric for analysis and a method for communicating results that they used to develop and examine dispersion concepts designed for Boston. The results of these studies have been published and are available for use in future procedure development efforts focused on dispersion. So that's kind of a summary of um, that research. Next question is for Flavio at Massport. Why is there no 94 unleaded fuel or 94 UL fuel sold at Massport's Hanscom Field? Uh, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, that uh, whether that fuel is sold or not. Um, I can I can understand kind of why the question is being asked. It's related to uh, low lead fuel that's primarily used by pist certain piston aircraft. I know that's a, a big concern for communities and for the industry, uh, and I, I, I know that there's a lot of work being done by the industry and uh, EPA and FAA to phase that fuel out. And um, as you may know, uh, the reason that that's an, a critical fuel is for safety purposes, that um, the fuel blend allows the aircraft to fly safely and the transition to a new fuel has taken time. Um, thank you. Okay, question for Barrett. 
How has safety improved since the RNAV compared to what used what used to happen before it? So let me repeat that. How has safety improved, I would say, since the introduction of RNAV compared to what was used used before that? So the introduction of RNAV procedures has uh, done a couple of things that are important to both air traffic and uh, from a pilot's perspective. Uh, first, it reduces radio congestion. You know, there's predictability in those flight paths. Uh, pilots can pre-plan hundreds of miles out what to expect. Controllers can look at an aircraft and know exactly where they're going to be without having to continuously turn or, or vector the aircraft, depending on what's going on. Secondly, as I said, it's 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 all about predictability for pilots and pre-planning. They can brief out what uh, arrival they're going to have or, or brief out what runway to expect. It creates consistency in the cockpit. It creates consistency in the control room. And then it just allows us to work on other aspects of our job to try to increase safety in other areas as well. So I'm not a pilot, um, and maybe I'll ask the, a pilot, the pilot, Steve, to, to, to answer this after, after me, but I think of the introduction of RNAV in um, performance-based navigation, satellite procedures, kind of like when I'm driving in the car. So I drive 128 every day to get to work, and that 128-93 interchange is incredibly complex. Um, I have a flat screen in my car that has navigation on it. It tells me traffic. It, it also um, has all the on-ramps and off-ramps. And so if I want to go back to the way it was before, then I, I'm not using my GPS, my phone, you know, any of that technology, and I have a paper map on my lap. So that doesn't seem like a really um, safe thing to do, um, especially when the technology exists. So maybe Steve, from a pilot's perspective, you know, what do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, sure, I, I think there's definitely some safety benefits uh, in this technology that we've been using now for years. I think one of the most important ones for the pilots is again, to the concept of a stabilized approach and the FAA has been putting out guidance for pilots and encouraging them to use uh, more vertical guidance. So some of the old procedures would give you, like you said, on the ground, on your map, on Route 28 or so, um, you know, which way to turn and what route to follow. But in a three-dimensional you know, airspace, it's also important to plan your descent from high altitude down to the runway. And we used to have to do step downs, as we called it, where you descend down to a certain altitude, level off till you get to a certain fix, take the next step down to a certain altitude. So it was more like a stepped approach. And this uh, provides most runways in the U.S. now with vertical guidance. And you can do one constant descent from altitude down to the runway, which is a much safer, uh, proven to be much safer um, way to uh, land an aircraft. Okay. Uh, next question is for, uh, I'm going to ask Barrett to start us off. How do you manage runway closures in the event that wind direction is above five knots? but the preferred runway cannot be used. So when we're dealing with runway closures at Logan, those are all coordinated between the control tower and Massport and then coordinated up through us, the Tracon and Boston Center eventually. Uh, most of the time we can, we can plan for those closures. So we can plan an alternate runway use uh, for, for the day if there's maintenance that's gonna occur on that runway or there's uh, lighting that needs to be fixed, you know, something that's occurring on the airfield that's closing it. Uh, now there are times that Runway closures do happen quickly. You know, an aircraft lands, blows a tire, uh, Massport and uh, the airport crew get out there and they clean up the, the remnants of that tire. Um, so we do have to react on the fly there. But for the most part, we, we've got a good system down between ourselves, Massport, and the users to, to understand what closures are going to occur and how long they're going to last for what that, that expectation is throughout the day. You know, um, the other things that do occur that, that people I'm sure see when they're flying, there are bird strikes, there are pavement failures, uh, an aircraft can't get off the runway, they're disabled for some reason. So with all those things uh, occurring, uh, we do have to be agile and, and adjust on the fly. But for the most part, we, we do have a solid plan. We start out throughout the day. As things change, we'll adjust. But it's uh, it's all about communication between us and Massport. Flavio, anything you want to add to that? Sure. I, 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 we, we work very closely with the FAA. Uh, we, when we work with the FAA, uh, we try to minimize the disruption. So unless we really have to. So 
Uh, we try to avoid taking a runway, for example, if the FAA wants to be on the force because of a northeast wind, we're not going to, unless there's some type of emergency, we're not going to take that runway. Uh, and and we're going to uh, probably do something else in another part of the airfield that we can access. Uh, obviously, if there's construction, major construction, we have to work very closely with them. Or if there's, a, as uh, Barrett mentioned, uh, emergency situation. Looks like we might have lost Flavio there. Okay, Barrett, I wanted to go back to you actually for, um, you mentioned uh, Tower, Tracon, and Center. And yes. um, can you just talk talk a little bit about what that means? And I know there's controllers in all three of those locations and um, just to help for folks that maybe don't understand that terminology. Sure. So as far as the tower is concerned, uh, everybody that travels through Boston knows that we have a beautiful control tower there that is very well known just by the look of it uh, across the world, honestly. I myself work at Boston Tracon, which is lo located up in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Boston Center, which is the en route facility, is located in Nashua, New Hampshire. They handle more of your high altitude. Like once you get on the highway, they're the ones that handle you to your destination, basically. So you start out at the tower. The Tracon handles you up to about 10 to 14,000 feet, depending on the location, hands you off to the center, and on the way into your destination, uh, it's just the reverse of that. And as far as, you know, the facilities that we have uh, in New England and the Boston district specifically, we've got a, a large number of federal facilities. There's a lot of contract towers, you know, Lawrence, Beverly, Nord, all those facilities. Uh, so there's a large number of air traffic controllers, uh, staff specialists, managers, uh, tech ops folks. You know, I could guesstimate to say between uh, Greater New England and Upstate New York, we probably have somewhere near a thousand controllers and probably thirteen to fourteen hundred people overall that work to try to ensure that that this area of the country is the safest it can be. Thanks, and I know that you know the um, the Boston area is is critical to the efficiency of the overall national airspace system. So. While Boston, you know, we care about Boston and we care about what happens in this area. But when I'm going on vacation to Florida, I care about the that I'm going to get to Florida on time. So the whole Boston integrating with the rest of the the system, I mean, that's important too, right? Absolutely. I mean, to to use a kind of a cliche phrase here, Boston's the tip of the spear, right? Where we're the end of the world as far as air traffic and and the continental U.S. So we're an origin and a destination airport. And when things start to get delayed here, they start to ripple throughout the system because Boston is usually the first airport that wakes up in the morning. So what we do here is important to make sure that the NAS can stay on time throughout the day. Great. Great. Well, don't take a break here because next question is for you too. What is the suggested altitude for flights going over tech and can it be increased? So the tech waypoint does not have an altitude restriction. Let will start with that. Uh, I was recently surveyed to put an altitude restriction on the procedure, and it was rejected because it placed an excessive climb gradient on the procedure, which would negatively impact safety. Okay. Another question for you. Barrett Brown noted that the new RNAV approach is used for nocturnal overwater arrivals to 33 left. The approach is not gradual, but looks like it looks like a staircase. He noted it is only used for the new overwater approach to 33 left. This is simply not true. The staircase arrival to 33 left is being used for the majority, if not all nocturnal arrivals to 33 left. Why are a town 20 miles out being burdened with intense noise when after it is followed by seven to 12 miles to le of level off? These planes are over land until Hull. All right. So the approach that I was referring to is the new RNAV approach. We have the uh, RNAV or what's called an RNP approach X-ray to runway three, three left. So because it's an RNP approach, it requires special air crew authorization. Um, not all pilots or aircraft are certified to fly this approach, and they uh, have to be offered a conventional approach in lieu of that. Um, the RNP approach has a continuous descent once the approach is started. So once they start that approach, it is a continuous curved descent in there. Um, but again, if, if an air crew cannot fly that approach, we've got to offer them another conventional approach that they can fly. And what would be some reasons why, and maybe this is for Steve um, or, or, or Heidi, why, why would they not be able to fly it? 
uh, I guess I'll start. I think the most important thing is the aircraft has to be properly equipped with some of that, you know, new technology in there. Uh, at Cape Air, we don't have that ability. I know some of the advanced jet aircraft do, and that's why they're designing these procedures. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that. I mean, not only does the aircraft have to be equipped, but as Barrett mentioned, the crew has to have authorization and have gone through special training to utilize those procedures. So in some some cases, especially in the business aviation world, um, that, that's a pretty complex process. And so they may not have the, the training that is required to conduct those. And I'll add in, uh, Colleen, that um, from a from most of the major air carriers are now working very hard to make sure that we're updating our aircraft so that we have both the equipment and the um, uh, and the trained air crews uh, to be able to fly these approaches when they're available. Uh, Jet, JetBlue is uh, one of the airlines that is uh, equipped and trained, um, but there's also United and uh, Alaska and, and a number of the other major carriers. Great, thanks. Okay, next question. Um, I'm gonna ask both probably Barrett and Steve to cover this one. Does FAA direct flight schools where to concentrate flight training maneuvers? So I'll jump on that from the FAA perspective. We, the FAA, do not direct pilots where to concentrate their flight maneuvers. Um, generally, flight schools and pilots will conduct those flight procedures when they're doing their training away from busy airports. It's just easier for them to operate in a less congested area. And they know the impact that it does have on the rest of uh, the air traffic controllers and the pilots and flight crews in, in and around them. So we do not tell them where to go. They operate in classy airspace, generally speaking. And um, that's that's about all on that one. Sure. Uh, from my perspective, you know, it's, it's very busy around Boston. And so some of the surrounding um, flight schools at some of the satellite airports have to uh, avoid certain airspace. So there's different altitudes that go out to different distances that you have to have a clearance specifically from air traffic control to enter that airspace. So generally for flight training, they'll either stay uh, below the outside of that or well enough uh, distance wise uh, to remain so they don't need the specific clearance to do each maneuver um, from air traffic control. And so Colleen, maybe I'll jump in as well as a flight instructor myself. I know, you know, there, there are certain requirements that we have to comply with as we're conducting training. And so aside from trying to stay out of controlled airspace and, and outside the flows into and out of Boston, we're also making sure that we're complying with the requirements that we need to train to. So there are a lot of factors um, that go into where that training you know, occurs. And I can tell you uh, as, as an operator and, and a flight instructor that we're, we're not trying to disturb the peace, right? We really truly want to be good neighbors and typically we'll go to areas that are not over um, communities with any time that we can do that, we do. Great, thank, thank you all. And I also know that, I guess I wanna just mention that, you know. Um, General aviation and uh, those smaller aircraft and those smaller operations, that's the pipeline of the future commercial pilots. So without that, those training opportunities and those, um, those other airports to do those uh, training maneuvers out of, um, you know, we're, we're not going to have the pipeline of pilots and, uh, you know, that we need to continue to have a strong national airspace system. So um, general aviation is a really important part of keeping a safe and efficient national airspace system. All right, next question. How do you inform communities about extraordinary events such as cranes impacting runway selection? So let me see, I'm going to ask Flavio for his help on this one too, but I'll just start with saying that um, I think we can do better. Um, I think there are opportunities to uh, share that kind of information more effectively with communities. Um, there are a number of processes that are in place with FAA in terms of evaluating obstructions. 
um, those obstructions are evaluated and um, impacts are determined, yet FAA doesn't actually make an approval or a, a denial. They evaluate impacts and then um, identify mitigations. But that part about informing communities, I think, is an area that um, we can work more effectively with Massport on, particularly for Boston. So maybe Flavio, um, what's your perspective? Yeah. I think there's uh, somebody with the mic on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you then. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that the difficulty with cranes is that we really don't know the impacts because it's very difficult to predict uh, pilot um, decisions. Um, some of the impacts are tactical and uh, it's different when we have a major runway closure. We know what the impacts will be because the runway will be closed and we can provide much more information, much more detail, detail information than if we have something that Maybe an impact yeah. depending on wind and weather, and depending on um, uh, uh, ceilings and pilot, individual pilot tactical decisions. But I agree with you, Colleen, that we can think about how we can share information. Uh, sometimes the process is so automated that we might not even know about it until the crane is up. So I think we need to work uh, with you to try to figure out a, a way to inform folks. But I want to let folks know that it's gonna be very difficult to predict uh, specific impacts just because there are so many variables associated with that. Thanks, Flavio. Okay, next question. Um, when will planes landing in a Southwest wind situation stop flying over Peabody at or below 2000 feet every 30 seconds? What is happening with the results of the MIT study that said there was a safe alternative landing for 22 left landings that could go over the ocean near Nahant? No one knows the answer to this. Has the new landing been tested and when will it be implemented? So I think I can probably answer the second half, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Barrett to cover that first part. Um, when will planes landing in a Southwest wind situation stop flying over Peabody at or below 2000 feet every 30 seconds? Well, uh, thanks, Colleen. So the RNAV GPS for 22 left, it's been in development for quite a while as part of the Block 2. Um, it's not in effect yet. It's still being uh, going through the process. But once it does, so, you know, this my understanding of what that procedure looks like. It's going to be changed. So the aircraft are going to stay over the water longer and end up um, joining the final on about a four mile final if they cross the Nahant Causeway. So there is a procedure that is in process at this point. Once that goes into place, we'll start using it as soon as we can. Mm. And can you just touch on the, that? That sounds awful low. Two thousand feet over Peabody is that? Does that make sense to you? You know, I I don't think that that is necessarily an accurate statement. I think that we've got a situation where we've got a lot of larger aircraft that are going in in and out of the Boston Airport. Airlines have switched to, to larger a uh, larger fleet mix and moved away from that smaller regional regional look. I think that. A lot of times people see a larger aircraft and just assume it's lower because it looks bigger than they're used to seeing. So uh, I, I don't know if that, that 2,000 feet is, is true right there. But I, I can understand that occasionally it probably does happen, but I don't think it's something that happens on a regular basis. Okay, thanks. So um, I think you actually covered pretty well the status of that procedure. Um, maybe I'll just turn to Veranda and she can touch on um, the environmental analysis that goes along with the implementation of that new 22 left approach procedure? Yes, um, for the 22 left um, procedure, what we did, the FAA, we um, did an internal review and they did a noise assessment. And based off the noise assessment and no, um, no other environmental impacts, it was completed with a category exclusion. Uh, I'm, the, the publication date is for later on at the end of the year. And that's, that's press all the updates I have right now. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that it makes it through the process and um, hopefully be in use later in the year. And I'm a North Shore resident too, so I'm excited about that one. Great. Okay, next question is for Barrett. I live in Hull near the Hull Cohasset town line. I am a senior and have lived here all my life. 
I have definitely seen and heard an increase in flights. Planes used to fly down the middle of the Straits Pond, but during the past five to 10 years, more have been flying directly over the Green Hill residential neighborhood. JetBlue seems the one seems to be the one airline that flies an arrival route over the water. Why are more airlines not flying over the middle of the Straits Pond or out over Mass Bay instead of directly over residential neighborhoods? So I think we can go back to the uh, discussion we were having about the RNAV X rate of three three left. Um, again, it's an RNP approach. It's designed to fly over water with a curved approach. Uh, does require a different air crew authorization and different equipment on board the aircraft. So with all of those things in place, more airlines will be able to do it. Uh, but until everyone is, is up to par as far as the training and equipment, unfortunately, we will still have some aircraft that will be flying a, a normal uh, ILS. Okay. And I think we heard from Lee earlier that JetBlue is one of those airlines that has equipped and has trained pilots. Um, I will also mention that uh, after... Uh, um, some conversation with the Massport Community Advisory Committee um, earlier this year, we uh, have spent some time looking into the use of that procedure and are looking at ways to um, increase its usage. So um, that it was it was implemented in December of 2021, so a little over a year ago, and um, the usage is not up to where we would like it to be. So we're, we are looking at ways that FAA can influence um, the, in, the increased use of that procedure. Next question for Barrett again. Why is the new RNAV approach that was designed to keep nocturnal arrivals to 33 left over the water starting in Marshfield in the descent noise over the ocean, not the primary nocturnal arrival path used. After the year long, years long MIT FAA study, why is this not the primary nocturnal arrival to 33 left path? And if it's not being used, the approach style of staircase rather than gradual approach is still being used over land. Why? So, Again, the, the same, basically the same answer I just have given a couple of times to the RNAV X ray 33 left. But to add on to it, as far as the primary approach that is used, so we, this is our primary approach that we advertise during nocturnal times when the weather allows us to. You know, there are weather considerations to go in this. It does not have the same weather minimums as our, like a, a Cat 3 ILS, which goes right down to the ground, basically. So we do have to take that in consideration. But it is uh, when we are able to, when weather and volume allow us. On uh, during our nocturnal times, it is the primary approach that we advertise. Right. Okay. Thanks. And that that has the continuous descent once the approach is started, right? Yes, continuous descent and curved approach. It's it's not a step down procedure. Okay. Next question is for uh, Steve from Massport. How? Is the air quality monitored in communities under the flight path? Uh, Colleen, I, I can take that. If that's okay. okay. Great. Thanks, Fabio. Um, so I can answer it in three ways. One is uh, that we do do annual reporting on our uh, emissions uh, based on many different factors. That's done through the environmental data report uh, using the FAA uh, model called AEDT. And we report out on many different uh, factors, including volatile organic compounds or CO, NOx, et cetera. Uh, the second thing is we, we are we're engaged with the FAA, uh, the Ascent Center of Excellence, which is doing uh, a lot of research on noise and emissions. And part of that collaboration is we're hosting and working with local universities that are actually doing uh, at, um, uh, ultra fine particle monitoring around the airport. We've also worked at B Tufts or Boston University. We've also provided data to uh, Olin College, has done a lot of monitoring. Um, finally, as Lisa, uh, our CEO, mentioned early on the video, there's a whole net zero effort that's underway that's uh, getting us to a net zero by 2031 on emissions we control, uh, as well as we work with uh, our partners on emissions that are out of our media purview. And in that work, we do a lot of analysis related to our CO emissions and how do we tackle them and reduce those. So there's a lot of different ways we get to do that. 
and we report it out on a regular basis through the environmental data report. Thanks, and, and Richard, anything you wanted to add to that? I guess the only thing I would add to that is that I'm not aware of uh, any airports that have their own air quality monitors that are constantly monitoring air quality. Uh, I just don't know if that exists. What I do know is that the EPA through the Clean Air Act has a nationwide system of air quality monitors that's been running for decades. And uh, the, the management of that system has been delegated mostly to the states, but it's still overseen by the EPA. And uh, all agencies can tap into that system of nationwide air quality monitoring uh, as they need it for their uh, air quality assessments. And people can find that information on the EPA website. Interesting, thank you. Next question is for Massport as well. We received a few questions about where community members can find specific information about noise levels in their town. So Steve, can you tell us about the reports that the airport produces? Sure, thanks Colleen. Yeah, so we have uh, 30 noise monitors uh, around Logan Airport and we have six around Hanscom Airport. Um, our summary data is in our environmental data reports, which is reported yearly, um, accessible through the Massport website under uh, environmental reports. So you can see all that summary data for all 30 of those sites. If you have more specific questions about more event data, specific timeframes, you know, that's when it's best to give the noise office a call so we can investigate and uh, get that information uh, for anyone that's interested in it. All right, next question. Uh, I'll ask Barrett to start us off on this one. We are told runway use is influenced by wind direction, but what else determines runway use at Logan and who decides which runways should be used? So other than wind, the runway configurations are also influenced by demand versus capacity. So demand is the amount of arrivals and departures on any given hour. Capacity is how many arrivals and departures the airport can handle for that given hour. So it's always a balancing game of demand versus capacity there, taking into consideration wind and weather. Um, as far as who has the final decision on what runways are going to be in use, that comes down to the tower supervisor in, at Boston Logan. Uh, they make their final determination, but they don't do that in a vacuum. Uh, they collaborate with the TRACON and Boston Center, and we in turn collaborate with the command center down in uh, DC and also with our airline partners to figure out what the uh, flight schedules look like for the day. If there's going to be some kind of weather impact, that's going to reduce the, the demand that we don't know about, or if there's some kind of uh, maintenance that needs to be uh, completed by mass ports, so all those things go into it. But the, the top two are our weather, uh, wind and weather, and then capacity and demand. Mm. Okay. And maybe Lee, you can talk about the, the airline aspect of it. And Barrett mentioned the command center and kind of how that, demand part works? Yeah, we work with, um, on a strategic planning uh, timeframe every day, we'll uh, coordinate with the um, Air Traffic System Command Center, which is the uh, FAA facility that kind of oversees the overall um, National Airspace System. And as Barrett mentioned, takes a look at what the demand is um, at a specific airport and then also what the expected configurations are um, and and what uh, arrival and departure capacity is associated with that. So we'll certainly share any changes that we might have to our schedules or if we've maybe changed the type of aircraft that we're flying. Um, we can also coordinate uh, with the um, with the tower as, as well as the other facilities on um, if um, there's a special circumstance, uh, you know, maybe we're landing a little bit heavier than we expected to and we might need to request uh, one of the longer runways than what we had originally uh, done in our flight plan. Um, but that is all gonna be done uh, based on uh, what the current operation is. And we, we certainly don't make that, we don't make those decisions uh, without contacting um, the, as Barrett said, uh, the air traffic control tower and making sure that it works with the rest of the operation. Thanks. Um, so I just wanna mention um, the FAA command center was mentioned a couple of times. Um, I was looking at the FAA's YouTube channel um, 
for yesterday's workshop. And I noticed there's a video that says uh, a day in the life at the command center. So um, if you want to learn more about the command center, um, check out FAA's uh, YouTube channel. And um, it's pretty interesting, uh, the work that goes on there. Okay, next question for Richard. How is noise measured from airplane landings when the wheels touch down and speed brakes are deployed? The, uh, the actual measurement of uh, aircraft noise is done when new aircraft and engines are developed and the noise levels generated by those aircraft are measured to ensure that they comply with the international standard. The noise standards for jet aircraft in the United States is, is set by international treaty that then flows downhill to federal regulations. Um, and those noise levels are utilized in FA computer modeling. Whenever any airport wants to do a noise analysis, they use a computer model that uh, the FA owns called AEDT, the Aviation Environmental Design Tool. It's the same computer model that both calculates noise and air emissions from aircraft. And when an airport does a noise study, whether it's in an environmental assessment or a, a specific standalone noise study, uh, the, all the data that's entered into the model includes all the flights in and out of the airport for a year, the exact location of the runway ends on the earth, the, the flight tracks using radar data, the weather data uh, for the whole year. And then that computer model runs runs the airport for a whole year and and the output is a um, noise contour model showing all the noise all around the airport generated by all the aircraft that go in and out. So that that calculation is done by the noise model and it's very helpful not only to determine what's the noise now, but what might it be in the future if there's a change made, if a new runway is built or runway is extended or some other change to the airport, you can actually predict what the future might be. Uh, and that's where the computer model really is very helpful because sitting there measuring aircraft noise certainly can be very valuable, but you, you, what you need is a way to predict future noise to help in your decision-making. And that's where the AEDT model comes in very handy. Sorry about that. Next question is for Flavio. How does Massport monitor air quality and noise from Logan operations? And can I get a noise monitor at my house? So I can start and then I'll turn it over to Steve. Um, I've, I think I've already answered the air quality component of this question. Um, and regarding the noise, uh, it, the ADT model that Richard talked about and I talked about earlier also does the noise modeling, obviously, along with the air quality mo modeling. So we do that on a regular annual basis and and uh, and we produce that. And then Steve does a lot of mo actual uh, monitoring through a network and also publishes that information. Steve, why don't you explain that a little clearer? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, we have those 30 noise monitors around Logan um, recording noise around the clock and um, that data we publish um, in summary form on the EDRs. Um, as far as um, the second portion of the question, can I get a noise monitor in my house? We do have the ability through our uh, noise monitoring software to um, apply virtual noise monitors, which kind of utilize more of the technology that Richard was discussing with the AEDT model, which basically models aircraft noise at a particular location. Um, so we can kind of utilize those to get some of the aspects of having an actual noise monitor, but just using the modeling uh, rather than a physical uh, noise monitor. Um, so it's beneficial too, because it kind of, um, we get a lot of background noise in a noisy city environment and the modeling kind of um, really uh, gets rid of some of that background noise information. The model's just looking at aviation related noise. So it's a little bit cleaner way to look at the, the data where we're just looking at aviation related noise. Okay. Next question is gonna have a Barrett start us out. In Melrose, aircraft fly lower over us now than before. What changed? 
So uh, aircraft over Melrose, uh, there's been no change in altitude assignment to any lower altitude than, uh, than we've had in years past. And there's been no procedures that have been put in effect that would require them to do so. Um, as I said before, when we were discussing the, the, the PBD situation, we do have larger aircraft. They do appear lower because they are large. And I think that is, is, is part of what we're seeing here uh, when we have these conversations. Just on a side note, I know a lot of people think that air traffic controllers are uh, very finite in how we vector aircraft and we, we know exactly what community they're going over at all times. We do not depict towns or communities on our radar scopes. We look at uh, and we look at airspace, we look at airways, we look at airports. So we, we don't actually see your town specifically. So it's it's waypoints and fixes that we're flying over. Okay, thanks. Um, I think Steve, you may have a little more insight into this as well, um, because I know Massport answers you know, a, a lot of the noise complaints and does some investigation there. So anything you wanna add on that? Sure, and it kind of ties into what Barrett was explaining. Definitely the perception uh, plays a role in seeing the aircraft, especially larger aircraft, as you mentioned, we're seeing a return to uh, international travel. So we're seeing a lot larger jets coming into play and a general transition from all the airlines to a little bit larger uh, aircraft. And that can definitely seem like from the ground um, that they're closer, but um, you know we do have a nice tool on the Massport website on their live uh, flight tracker where people, if they're concerned about the altitudes can actually track these aircraft um, to, to check their altitudes to see if there's any changes. And we can also obviously help uh, with the noise office as well. If they file a complaint with their concerns, we can definitely research it to make sure that the aircraft, you know, are no operating in their, their normal altitudes. Okay. okay, next question is for Steve from Cape Air. What makes Cape Air operations different than other propeller planes? Can they operate at another airport besides Logan? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question. Uh, Cape Air, we are a scheduled airline that operates uh, twin engine aircraft. We have uh, propeller driven reciprocating engines, um, usually nine passengers. And uh, we provide high frequency flights to many airports um, into and out of Logan, but also throughout the whole New England area, um, into New York and New Hampshire, Maine. Um, we're also out in four, four other regions throughout the United States as well. But that's the biggest difference for us. I've also heard of something called essential air service. Is Cape Air involved in that? And maybe can you explain a little bit about what that means? Of course, essential air service, uh, known as EAS, is a system to provide small communities um, air service to larger airports, such as Logan. So we, we fly into Logan um, from Saranac Lake and up in the Adirondacks, um, up on the coast of Maine. So these small communities have ability to get air service provided to larger hubs to make connections to other airlines as well. And we do that throughout the United States as well. Okay, next question. Um, I'll share this one with Barrett, I think. Um, air travel is very safe and has been for decades, which is a good thing, right? Um, well before the implementation of PBN and RNAV procedures. What is the incremental benefit in terms of risk reduction and increased safety using these procedures versus the significant cost to the health and well being of those living under the concentrated flight paths? So uh, maybe I'll ask Barrett to answer that one first. Sure. Over to you, Barrett. So, from an air traffic and tech ops perspective, uh, the cost of maintaining ground based Navigational aids is just it's getting unsustainable. Um, finding parts for some of these older systems uh, that aren't developed and made anymore is just becoming a process that it's just it's not something we can do in a timely manner. And it's it's the cost is just it's that's probably the most paramount part is, is the cost. Um, the PBN systems that we have in place as far as our performance based uh, navigation has hugely increased our, our safety margins. And it's uh, made the predictability, as we've talked about, so much greater for our air traffic controllers and our flight crews that it's just, it's almost immeasurable how much it's changed how we operate. Um, it does allow us for expansion, like we talked about, because the airline industry and, and the users, uh, the, the users of the airlines uh, want to fly more. You know, we're getting back into the travel way of life, and uh, the system needs to expand. And PBN allows us to expand at a much more rapid pace, 
and allow to allows us to have more volume uh, in a tighter tighter amount of airspace, honestly. Okay, so um, I I wanted to just mention the part we talked earlier about the RNAV the the MIT Block Two study RNAV twenty two left approach procedure that pushes aircraft away from land on the North Shore um, further over water and then over the Nahant Causeway. So the reason that that can be done is because of um, PBN, right? I mean, could you have done that with ground-based navigation aids? I don't think there's any in the water, right? No, the, the ground-based navigation aids also have limits as far as how far that their service that they're providing, their signal actually reaches. Um, so the use of PBN and the RNAV uh, procedures allows us to create um, routes where we couldn't do it before, but be, you know, based on uh, geographic issues, um, geological issues, as far as you know, mountains and um, it, any other kind of natural restriction we might have. So it allows us to get around those and push them further out over the water, as you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any anybody else have anything to add on that one? Yeah, Colleen, I think one thing I'll add into that is uh, the question talked about the safety versus noise implications of uh, <clears throat> newer improved navigation. I think the one thing that the, the question missed was, I think the driving force behind new forms of navigation was perhaps not safety, but capacity. Uh, I think Logan is perhaps the 20th ranked airport in the nation based on number of flights. And of those top 20 or 30 airports, uh, they're really, really busy, and there are times when they're too busy. And if you can use improved navigation aids to allow more flights safely in and out by having flights, aircraft closer together, but still safely, that benefits the people on the planes. So I think um, the, the people on the aircraft who can get in and out of uh, their destinations quicker because there's new navigation aids that allow the aircraft to come and go a little quicker, a little closer together, and still do it safely. I think that's the benefit to the system that probably was the driving force. Okay, and then I think we can go back to one of the questions that we talked about earlier in terms of putting restrictions, airport restrictions, curfews, um, limiting types of operations is, you know, I guess my response, um, maybe perhaps from the community to, uh, you know, making the system more efficient and and being able to accommodate more aircraft is so. Why don't we just tell them they can't land? Why don't we just limit the amount of flights? And we can't do that. I think is what I heard. But also from a market perspective, I think Lee um, spoke about that earlier earlier tonight around um, you know the the airlines um, go where the markets are. Uh, and, you know, the amount of flights is driven by market forces, where they are going and when they're going. Hey, Colleen, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to add some, just some uh, uh, context on this discussion. Um, over the years, there's two, two, two long-term trends have been happening, and we can, we can continue to see that. One is uh, the number of flights have actually down at Logan over the, over the decades. So if you look at where we were, uh, in 2000 or the late 90s, there was a lot more flights and less passengers. And over the years, the airlines have uh, 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 upgaged and that's allowed them to put more passengers on less flights. So we had almost 500,000 flights pre-2000 and now we're at 400 something thousand flights or even less because of we're coming from COVID, but yet we have more passengers. So that trend has been uh, a positive from that perspective. And then also the, the engines have gotten a lot more quieter. So, so although obviously people are impacted by our operations and obviously by this commute, by the kind of questions we're getting tonight, uh, 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 it's clearly it's something that we need to improve as we can go forward. We recognize that, but the industry has done a lot of good work in terms of reducing uh, uh, engine noise from the source and our contours have actually been shrinking over the years. Uh, however, you know, we can still do more and, and this is evidenced by these questions we're getting tonight. Okay, thanks, Flavio. Okay, next question 
is uh, I'm going to start out with Steve from Massport. The number of complaints since 2013 have increased exponentially. 2013 year to date complaints were 695. Year 2023 complaints are 68,224. This is a 9,716% increase. If Massport claims it's committed to noise abatement, why has noise increased this much? And what is FAA in, the Mass, in Massport planning to do to abate noise? Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, so, you know, we have to be careful not to compare um, the complaint numbers to actual noise increases. As, as Flavio just mentioned, um, you know, uh, our noise contours are shrinking. The air, aircraft are quieter. We've seen... Um, you know, a steady increase to stage five aircraft, which are the quietest aircraft out there at Logan. Um, so the, the numbers we're seeing in the increase in complaints is more due to the methods at which people are complaining. And in 2013, 2010, we saw lots of complaints coming in via just the telephone. Um, with online complaints, um, you know, we've seen the number drive up dramatically, especially with uh, third party apps that people are able to complain by pushing a button. That has dramatically increased our numbers of complaints that started the push button complaints started in about 2018 and really saw a dramatic increase um so the increase really isn't so much to do with noise as it is the, the methods to complain have become easier um you know which we want we want people to be able to complain if they're bothered um, but that's really what what has driven that number up and if you look at actual individuals complaining that number has remained pretty steady over the years, which um, you know is it tells us how many actual individuals are complaining, not how how frequently or how many times they complain. Thanks, um, Richard. Anything you want to add to that one? Yeah, I would agree with what Steve indicated that um, it's certainly much easier for people to complain, but I think also. Uh, um, it's it's human nature that you can't remember how you felt in a prior time. Uh, during COVID, when the flights were down dramatically at Logan and every other airport, things got quieter. I don't remember how that felt. All I can remember is how it feels today when a fly, uh, an aircraft flies over my head and wakes me up. And I think people, it's just human nature that uh, when it's quiet, people very quickly become accustomed to that environment. And what they feel is how they feel now based on what it was recently in some recent past time, which could have been quieter. Uh, so I think uh, using number of noise complaints to track noise is just not accurate at all. It never has been. Uh, Massport and the FAA can track the number of flights in and out of every airport, and we can calculate the noise based on that. And it it does not track well with the number of complaints, not just at Boston Logan, but at, at any airport. That's That's been seen time and time again. Um, historically, aircraft are getting quieter, but over time, the number of flights increase and most airports over the long term do get noisier. Uh, that's the way it has always been. Um, and the industry and the FAA continue to make aircraft quieter to try to to counteract that. And just a quick addition, additional context. Uh, when MIT started doing its work on the RNAV study, they looked at num uh, the residences, the addresses, the number of residences that complained and correlated that with the, with the uh, flight tracks. And they got a very good positive correlation between the flight tracks and that. So, and they're doing additional research on that and trying to get to a more uh, higher kind of fidelity of correlation. So, so uh, that also supports kind of the Steve's point about the number of uh, individuals or residences versus total numbers. Yeah, and Colleen, I guess I sh we should answer the, I kind of missed the second portion. What is the FAA and Massport planning to do about abating the noise? You know, we are restarting our residential sound insulation program to give people right around the airport some 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 noise benefits. We have the MIT study, some new you know noise abatement uh, flight procedures. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're doing to try to alleviate some of the noise issues. You know, we do take all the complaints seriously, and are making attempts to um, abate the noise as best we can. 
Great, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay, we're going to go back to the MIT study. Uh, Massport paid lots of money for an MIT study of landing and departures. When are you going to implement the findings for a new path for landings to runway 22 left? So that uh, approach procedure is in development. We talked about that a little bit earlier tonight. And um, the uh, procedure publication is anticipated uh, later this year. OK, next question is for Steve from Cape Air. It's early, but do we have a sense of whether electric or hybrid power will reduce propeller plane noise, or is it mostly generated by the props themselves? That's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> it's, it is early, but it's a really exciting time. Uh, there are several manufacturers that have approached Cape Air and, and industry-wide looking for support. We have been involved with some of these engineers. Uh, from what I know so far, it's going to make a significant reduction in, in overall noise. Um, think of it as an electric motor instead of an aircraft engine with exhaust and everything. The propellers do make a certain amount of noise that you, you can't really avoid. You can mitigate. So it won't be silent, but significant reduction in noise is my understanding from the engineers we've spoken to so far. Yeah, that's an exciting future development, that's for sure. Very much. Okay, um, I see it's a little past eight o'clock. Um, we're gonna keep going. We're still getting questions. So I uh, hope you can hang in with us. Next question is for Richard and it's in two parts. It's a little bit long, so bear with me. Part one is, I understand that quieter planes are phasing out noisier ones. Is that true for Logan? If so, when will we hear a change? I understand these are stage five noise certification, which I believe is SNL 50 to 55 dB. That's part one. Part two, when were the public hearings held prior to implementing the next gen system? What triggers public hearings and how is the public alerted? Yeah, I think uh, Flavio from Asper can talk more about their uh, uh, the aircraft that fly in and out of Logan. It's my understanding that a very high percentage are uh, stage four, three and four aircraft. I think the the thing that's driving that is not necessarily so much the desire for the airlines to have quieter airplanes, but newer airplanes are much more fuel efficient and there's a real cost to flying aircraft that are not fuel efficient. So that most airlines have been retiring the older aircraft because they're very expensive to fly. So now most airlines at Logan and, and elsewhere are flying very new aircraft because they are uh, cheaper to fly. And, and luckily for all of us, they're also quieter to fly. So I think uh, it's my understanding that Logan for the, for the most part has uh, their fleet is mostly made up of, of the, the quietest aircraft. So maybe Flavio has some more data on that. <clears throat> That's true. Uh, we tend to be either at or ahead of the, of the industry in terms of our fleet mix because we're a desirable destination and the airlines like to put their newest planes in our market. We pro probably our fleet, now stage three is the minimum legal today and our fleet is probably 90% stage four or better. And the stage five is a significant chunk of that too and growing. So, so uh, that is part of the explanation of why, uh, you know, although we still have a lot of irritated folks regarding overflights, that the noise itself, the noise energy that's being produced is actually shrinking. I guess to part two of the question, Colleen, uh, regarding public hearings, uh, the when new procedures are, are developed at any particular airport, uh, FAA air traffic uh, needs to make environmental determinations for those procedures, and they've done that. It does not necessarily mean that there are public hearings, quote unquote. I think some people get locked into that term public hearings. Um, those are, there's very limited instances where an actual public hearing where people come to a room and provide testimony are required by law. What is required is under the National uh, Environmental Policy Act, the FAA follows that those procedures when developing uh, new procedures for aircraft at any airport. Uh, and we've discussed earlier some of those 
environmental assessments and category of exclusions for procedures that have been developed uh, here at Boston Logan. Okay, so I think to kind of summarize, when when people hear hear next gen, next gen is a is a term that comprises a, a multitude of different elements in the national airspace system, um, implemented over several years across the country and um, as a comprehensive package. You know, that's not what is subjected to NEPA, as you were saying, Richard, right? It's each individual change. Correct. Every individual federal approval uh, has to follow NEPA. And a, a large sort of comprehensive program going forward to improve the national aviation system is not a, a specific federal approval. All right. Next question. This is for Steve from Massport. I understand that there was only one noise monitor in Medford. How can I learn the locations of the other 29 monitors? Sure. Yeah, so there, there is only one noise monitor in Medford. Um, we do have a couple in East Boston. Some of the closer in communities, Winthrop, uh, have a multiple noise monitors, obviously, with their proximity to the airport. Um, but you could have learned the exact locations of all the sites uh, around Logan by visiting the Massport website under noise abatement, um, Logan Airport noise abatement, and then click on monitoring. There'll be a map of all the noise monitor locations, as well as descriptions of, of where they are. And again, any event specific um, data requests or anything like that can, can be uh, filed just by calling the noise office or uh, filing an online inquiry, and uh, we can certainly look that up. Okay, it looks like we've come to the end of our questions. Um, I've got one last question and I'm gonna ask uh, a variety of panelists to chime in on this one. How does the partnership between the FAA, Massport and the operators work? So I'll kick it off and just talk from an FAA perspective. The FAA's mission is to provide the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world and management of that national airspace system requires consistent coordination between all stakeholders. And that's, you know, all of those stakeholders um, are represented here today. FAA, airports, aircraft operators, and the communities, right? The communities are the folks that are asking the questions. So all of those folks are important to the conversation. Um, FAA, I feel, has a really strong relationship with Massport. Um, I think there's many different parts of FAA that work with different parts of Massport, and um, that relationship is strong. Um, maybe I'll just turn it over to Barrett to talk from an air traffic perspective. Um, where do you, how, how do you feel about that uh, relationship? You know, thanks, Colleen. Uh, the the relationship between the FAA and Massport, the operators, the users is is huge. You know, it's it's all about the safety of the operation, as you talked about. Uh, our national airspace system is the safest, most complex airspace system in the world, and we take a lot of pride in that. And safety is our number one priority. And we establish all these safety parameters, and we ensure that they're they're being used on a daily basis by communicating constantly with our users, with the airport operators, whether they're airfield maintenance folks. Uh, the, the airlines, um, different community groups, we're always talking with people. I mean, twice a day we have standing telecons. We talk with Massport, the National Weather Service, other facilities to talk about what our plan is for the day. We then every two hours talk to the command center. All the airlines are on there talking about what our plan was, how it's changing, you know, what the, what the next plan is. So it's this constant back and forth of letting people know what's going on, what our expectations are, how what has come up that surprised us, what things are changing, and how we're going to how we're gonna to adjust to, to make things work. You know, when an air traffic controller comes in for the first part of their shift, they know that there's nothing more important than safety. That is the expectation that never changes. We never waver on that. And when they walk out at the end of the day, they know that they've done everything they could to provide the, the safest operation for, for not only the people that are using it, but their friends and their families as well. We, we, all, have our, we all travel. We all have fan, uh, friends and family that travel. So it's important that we all make this as safe as possible to ensure that everyone can get home safe. Thanks. Maybe Flavio, what's your thoughts? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we work with the FAA every day, uh, like Barrett said, uh, and we have a very close relationship. Uh, safety, security, and operations, operational coordination happens at all levels at uh, at all our three airports, uh, uh, whether it's the folks on the airfield or, or the folks working uh, and planning out uh, the day or the week or the construction season. Uh, we also work very closely with the FAA region with Colleen's office on many policy initiatives like the RNAF study, which we did over multiple years and continue to follow. We work with the uh, Burlington office also in the airports division related to safety. The grants, uh, we receive grants, uh, uh, veil grants that, that target uh, emissions and reduce emissions by us in building inf electrical infrastructure, soundproofing grants that was mentioned by, by um, uh, 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 earlier by Steve. And also like Worcester, you know, we've talked about Worcester being a success. We have uh, airlines flying out of there and relieving Logan. And uh, we, we did it with the partnership, uh, just like uh, as was mentioned by Lisa in our opening video how we've invested so much money in, into the CAT3 system and into the airport itself. So it could be a viable airport and we leave Logan um, as well as Bedford relieving Logan. So, so it's a, it's a cross the board uh, partnership. Sometimes you agree to disagree like any, any close family and we coordinate and we work and we engage with the community and try to, to get things right. So um, uh, I guess that's my perspective on that. Thanks. How about our, sorry about that. Our industry folks here, Lee, Heidi, Steve, any thoughts? Well, I think that Flavio and Barrett have kind of said all of the the important words. I mean, you know, it is a it's it's a continuous collaboration. Um, we are all um, you know tied to this community. We have we're, we're part of the community. We live here. We work here. Um, it's important for us to make sure that um, we are providing uh, a safe, um, efficient service um, that meets the the interest and needs of the community, um, both uh, as as they experience aviation as part of the uh, our customers and also um, in the broader uh, impacts that uh, affect anybody that lives near an airport. So it's uh, it's certainly important for JetBlue and for um, the other airlines to make sure that we're bringing subject matter experts into design meetings, providing access to our flight simulators so that we can test out these procedures to make sure that we're um, delivering uh, things that can actually be flown and help improve uh, the safety um, and the efficiency of the operation. Sure. Uh, Steve, I, I think I'd add to that, um, you know, sharing of information is really critical. And, uh, you know, starting with Massport, I think they do a fantastic job. I've been working with them for 28 years since I've been with KPAIR. They invite all the stakeholders um, to go up there in person or hold team meetings. An example could be if they're doing runway construction and they're going to take a runway out of service for a period of time, they're always looking to mitigate the effects of that. And they invite all the airlines and different users to be a part of that and help in the decision making. We spoke a lot with, you know, with Barrett and air traffic control is a big part of what we're talking about today. But there's other parts of the FAA, Colleen, that I'm sure you, you are very involved with that have to do with overseeing the safety and regulations of air, airlines. And that's what I'm involved with a lot. And um, we, we have great relationships with the regulatory side of the FAA as well. Um, standardization for training, equipment, inspections, all different parts of safety. And we're charged with operating at the highest level of safety. So we never rest to say, okay, we're doing really well, so that's good enough. It's always continuous improvement when safety is concerned. And these professionals do a great job. Thanks. Thanks. Heidi, any last words? No, I, I couldn't say it any better. I think everybody has hit the high points, um, but I, I do... Just want to add one thing. It's not just about the safety of folks in the air and our passengers and those in the back of our aircraft. It's also about safety of the folks on the ground. And we do care. I think that's why we're here answering questions from the community. And I've seen that that concern from FAA and from Massport and we as industry. So 
uh, I think it, it, it's all around, right? So it, safety is more th than just what's going on in the air. We do care about what's going on on the ground. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, that was our last question. I just have a few uh, closing remarks. I want to say that this workshop and discussion do not constitute a final agency action under do not constitute a final agency action or order issued by the Secretary of Transportation under Title 49, United States Code Section 46110. This meeting was informational only and as part of an ongoing dialogue between the FAA and its external stakeholders. We heard many good questions and I hope our answers were informative. If you'd like to view the workshop again, please visit FAA platforms on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You may also visit the project website page shown on the screen. Thank you to our specialists for, for, for providing their expertise. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you and have a good evening.